Thank you so very much. This is, I, I so appreciate the analogy of the weight. <laughs> I, I wondered why it was heavy, now I know. Now, now I know why it was heavy. Um, so first let me say thank you to Janice Jackson and to the Jubilee Singers for that inspiring performance. Join me in thanking our students again. I attended one of their rehearsals and they were singing and they said, we, want, we have a song we want to sing for you and they sang that song and I immediately invited them to come to this event. Uh, so if you, if you have a talent and you don't want me to use it, just keep it to yourself. Okay. Okay. To Governor Moore, uh, what a special privilege it is to have you here. Thank you for your kind remarks. We are honored to have you with us here today on this UMBC campus. I had the privilege and pleasure of attending Governor Moore's inauguration in January, and so much of what you said resonated with me. I remember him saying, Maryland can be bold, Maryland can leave and we lead, and we will not leave anyone behind. That was a beautiful statement. It just resonated so with me. Uh, this is a special moment in both of our stories, and UMBC is ready to partner with you on all things that are inclusive and excellent. So thank you for everything that you are doing. <laughs> to Delegate Chang and County Executive Olszewski, thank you for your presence. We welcome you here and all of the elected officials and government leaders, and I'm so happy that they just announced that you all were alums, right? <laughs> Proud alums. So thank you to all of the government leaders who have joined us here today. Thank you for your support of higher education and specifically of your investment in the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. To the system, University System of Maryland Board of Regents, Board Chair Gooden, and Chancellor Perman, thank you for entrusting me with the extraordinary privilege of leading this institution. To my fellow system presidents, I am so grateful for your warm and generous welcome and the pleasure of joining you in advancing Maryland's truly outstanding higher, public, higher education, pu public higher education system. These presidents have been a joy with which to work. To the people of Baltimore County, particularly our neighbors in Arbutus and Catonsville, and to the city of Baltimore, I am so thrilled to have found a home in this vibrant, beautiful region that is as southern in its hospitality <laughs> as it is fierce in its pride of place and people. To Susan McDonough, Brian Frazee, and our shared governance leaders. I thank you for the important roles and leadership, not only that you've played in today's ceremony, but also for your work with and for UMBC every day. To those here in the arena and those watching remotely, those among our campus community of students, faculty, staff, and our global communities of alumni, families and friends, I am grateful that you chose to be a part of this ceremony. This ceremony is about the entire community and not about a single person. And I want to say a special thank you to those, and I wanna honor those whose contributions have come together to put together all of the inauguration activities for this entire week. I just keep repeating, we haven't had one in 30 years. <laughs> So the work that they had to do to really come up with this and create this is just phenomenal. It has been a beautiful week. I do want to share some more personal thank yous also. To Dr. Henry Frierson, my first academic mentor, the person who saw me and then the person who saw in me, a professor. He then prepared me and he guided me into graduate school. What he has done for decades for underrepresented students in preparing us for careers in academia is simply extraordinary. Hank, I would not be here without you. <clears throat> to 
to Dr. Joseph D. Simone. I was his first PhD student. <laughs> I'm just saying. My PhD advisor, who did everything in his power to prepare me for the career of a lifetime. I cannot begin to tell you how much I owe him. It's a beautiful gift to have a PhD advisor who sees in you what you cannot see in yourself. He has remained committed to me consistently since the first day that I met him. And let me just say, when I met him, he was 25. <laughs> and, and I was 23. <laughs> and as he's talking about people who finish PhDs quickly, he finished his in three years. I'm just... Three years. Three years. Three years. And to Dr. Holden Thorpe, who is editor in chief of science journals, Holden spoke last evening. Holden gave me my first administrative role as director of undergraduate studies in the chemistry department at UNC Chapel Hill. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and he guided me with his values through administrative leadership in that role and in every role that I've had since. He has been wise counsel to me for many years and I treasure him as a friend. For the countless hours that they have given to me, for the many doors that they have opened for me, for remaining my go-to people who still see and create opportunities for me even to this day, for 40 years with Dr. Frierson, 32 years with that young Joe DeSimone, and with 20 years of consistent love from Holden Thorpe, that has been the reason why I've been able to do what I have done and to stand here today. I just wanna say that I am truly, truly grateful. Thank you all. So there's a, there's a family sitting in front of me. It's mine. Uh, they mean the world to me. They are present in full force today. I would like to acknowledge the entire Shears family. My eldest brother, James, don't stand up yet. I know you want to be singled out, but just hold on. I know you, I know you. His wife, Wilma, and their children and their families. My sister, Beverly, her wife Karen and Karen's family. My brother Brian, the baby, although I still claim to be the baby, just so you know. <laughs> My auntie Aura, who told me I could tell you that she is 91 years young. Yeah. And members of her family. And last but not least, my own precious children, James and Jada, would you please stand? Now the entire Shears family, please stand. Okay, y'all can sit down now. And if you're wondering, do we always travel as a Shears crowd, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. There are two people who are not here physically who I must also thank for this beautiful, supportive family, for our sense of humor and joy, for our love and encouragement of each other, for our spiritual grounding, and for our commitment to excellence, education, and to the service of others. And you, if you've heard me talk, you know I'm talking about my parents, James and Shirley Shears. My dad was a math and science teacher, as you have heard, a pastor and a presiding elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. My mother was an English teacher who loved Shakespeare and theater and who in her vocation started and ran a, started and ran a shelter for working and unhoused men in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina for 30 years. She did that while she had a full-time job. Recently renamed in her honor after her passing, this place was born out of a need to create what did not exist for those who were unseen, relegated to the outskirts of mainstream society and often forgotten. And let me tell you, they were the proudest parents I have ever seen. Obnoxiously proud. 
So they would have loved every ounce of today. And you would have been ready for them to go home by now. <laughs> for sure. They would have loved our students. They would have loved our values the same way that I do. And they would have loved how you have welcomed their daughter. So this is a surprise for my family. So on this day that honors this institution and the life-giving difference that it has made in the lives of so many, I am pleased to announce that I am establishing the James and Shirley Shears Family Scholarship Endowment at UMBC. This will be a need-based scholarship for undergraduate and graduate students, Ethan, <laughs> across the disciplines. And I can hear my mother's voice saying, now don't be skimpy. <laughs> uh -huh. Make sure you put enough in there so that the children have what they need. And I would be saying, yes, ma'am. I also want to thank my friends from North Carolina, my childhood neighborhood, friends and classmates from Clayton, my two best friends growing up from K through 12 are here. I know. <laughs> my dear friends from Durham, my cherished UNC Chapel Hill family who raised me as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, and to my more recent but deeply loved Duke friends who are here today. There they are. You know, there are few people in this world who can say that they love UNC and Duke, <laughs> especially at this time of year. And I count myself among those who love and have received love from both. I also want to acknowledge my newest friends in Maryland. I have new friends in Maryland. <laughs> and my Bethel AME Church family, my pastor in absentia and his wife, Reverend Cherie Smith Claiborne, thank you for being here. And to Marette Brown Clark, who was phenomenal. <laughs> Their love and ministry have welcomed, sustained, and Reverend Cherie expanded my life over this last year. All of these people, places, and institutions have given me a set of core values that I treasure. Because of them, I believe that education can change individual lives and families for generations to come. That true excellence can never be achieved without diversity. That leadership requires courage. And that every day that I am given the opportunity to encourage, support, and uplift another human being or learn something from them, that's a good day. And finally, I honor those who helped build this institution. I acknowledge all of the leaders who preceded me, Alvin Okun, Calvin B.T. Lee, Lewis Kaplan, and Michael Hooker. But today, I wanna to pay a special tribute to the leader who guided, grew, and imagined UMBC for 30 of its 56 years, President Emeritus Freeman Rabowski. <laughs> what Freeman did to create UMBC as we now know and love it, to lift up its mission and challenge all of higher education to follow UMBC's example of diversity, equity, and inclusion, to champion this community and continue to strive for innovation and progress, and to honor its people every year, every week, every day of his tenure is nothing short of amazing. And it is pure joy and a privilege for me to serve UMBC and to work each day to carry on his extraordinary legacy. 
I will tell you that when we realized that our schedules were not going to work for him to be here today, we were very sad. By the way, who do you think is the first person who texted me this morning? But in true Freeman style, what he told me to relate to you is that he's out working for UMBC. <laughs> I'll share a quick Freeman story with you. We all have them. I met him for the very first time 10 years ago. I was sitting in his office at a table, that table that had been there for 20 or so years. <laughs> and about 30 minutes into the conversation, he looked at me and he said, you're going to be a president one day. Now, at that time, I was a professor of organic chemistry, had not served as department chair, had not served as dean. So when I sat at that same table with him 10 years later last April and saw the look of that proud man on his face, the look on his face of a proud father, oh, let me tell you, that was special. And so I would like to take this opportunity to thank both Freeman and his wife, Jackie, uh, they have been a tremendous set of leaders for this institution, and we all are truly grateful. I'm going to ask you to stand and give them a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. As you might expect with an inauguration address, I am going to spend some time imagining our future and all that we will accomplish together. But first, I want to reflect on the journey that UMBC has taken already, because it is in that journey that we see everything we need to know about what we value, why it matters, and just what we can accomplish when we put our minds to something. This beautiful community was born out of a vigorous debate over the best way to meet the needs of the growing number of Marylanders heading to college in the 1960s. What type of institution should it be? Where should it be located? What would it be called? After more than a decade of commissions and reports, the University of Maryland Baltimore County was born with a groundbreaking upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples on January 25th, 1965, and with an official opening on September the 19th, 1966. I wanna tell you I was 13 days old. <laughs> we owe a debt of gratitude to all those who helped launch this institution especially the first four classes of UMBC students. We call them the founding four. I'm looking at them. They took a chance on this burgeoning institution. They are now proud alumni who are publishing, one moment, an inspiring book. They shared that book with me on Monday. So I just want to take a moment and honor the first four classes of students who came to UMBC. If you're present, would you please stand? As I reflect on UMBC's journey, there is so much to celebrate. You've heard some of it today. We have modeled for the world that inclusive excellence means for our, what it means for our students and how to achieve it. The Meyerhoff Scholars Program and, and uh, go ahead Meyerhoff Scholars, go ahead. <laughs> and an array of other scholar training programs have led UMBC to be the country's number one producer of black undergraduates who go on to earn doctorate, doctorate degrees in the life sciences, math, and computer sciences combined. We are also the nation's leading producer of black undergraduates who will go on to earn the combined MD, PhD, with Harvard being second.
they told me not to say this, but it's not even a close second. I wasn't supposed to say that. We are recognized nationally for the quality of our undergraduate teaching and as one of the most innovative universities in the US. UMBC is leading groundbreaking research throughout the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and mathematical sciences, and engineering and computing, and nur nurturing creative achievement in myriad artistic fields. We are defined by our extraordinary community, which was ranked as a top place to work again in 2022. And our alumni, about which you have heard, are making their mark in all fields locally and globally. From Speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates, Adrian Jones, to Kismikia Corbett, whose work led to the development of the Moderna vaccine for COVID-19. And there are so many more alumni achievements. With more than 70% of our graduates living and working in the state, including right here in Baltimore County with County Executive Johnny O, UMBC is helping to advance the Baltimore region and the state of Maryland. And we are not done. In the words of our previous leader, success is never final. UMBC possesses a willingness to continue to question the status quo, to consider the world's ever-changing challenges and circumstances, and to innovate to serve our students. In that spirit, this spring, our community came together in a series of campus conversations called UMBC Bold, sessions that laid the groundwork for the strategic planning that we will take up in the fall. These were deeply engaging discussions with more than 1,000 attendees. We heard bold aspirations for the undergraduate and graduate experience, for the research enterprise, economic development, community engagement, and more. I would like to pause and acknowledge the honorary co-chairs of this effort, Speaker Adrian Jones and Board of Visitors Chair Alan Wilson. I would also like to thank the co-chairs of the effort Professors Vandana Janeja and Michelle Scott, and Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Greg Simmons, as well as the 26 faculty, staff, student, and alumni leaders who facilitated 22 listening sessions online and in person. If you are one of those leaders and you are in the building, would you please stand? Throughout these conversations, again and again, I heard this community elevate and affirm the values that unite us. These values live in UMBC's vision statement, which was developed over a number of years by this community before I arrived. A vision is, by definition, aspirational. And I can say that this bold, clear statement has inspired me since the very first time that I read it, and it still gets me every single time. It is printed in the inside cover of your inauguration program, and I invite you to follow along as I read it. And think about the core values it articulates and how we will rise to achieve this vision in the years ahead. It states, our UMBC community redefines excellence in higher education through an inclusive culture that connects innovative teaching and learning, research across the disciplines, and civic engagement. We will advance knowledge, economic prosperity, and social justice by welcoming and inspiring inquisitive minds from all backgrounds. Do you all feel that? The f y yes, you may applaud.
The first time I read it, I said, these people are serious about being in the life-changing business. They said that they're going to change the economic trajectory of our students, which means we're changing that trajectory for their families and generations to come. They say that they're gonna put a stake in the ground on social justice, which means here, we don't believe in a hierarchy of human value. That's what they believe, and they said that everybody can participate. All you have to do is show up every day and welcome and inspire inquisitive minds from all backgrounds. For me, that's a statement, and it's a reason to get up and come to work every single day. While there are many measures and rankings in, in higher education here, that first line says that we are bold enough to say that not only do we refuse to deem ourselves excellent unless we do it through an inclusive culture, we are actually stating that true excellence is impossible without it. Years ago, I saw this powerful truth at work in my science, and I can hear my PhD advisor's voice repeatedly saying to me, Val, we learn the most from the people with whom we have the least in common. And he was not just talking about interdisciplinarity, but literally about the fact that the place where I was born those people who you heard about who raised me, their histories, their view of the world, and my own life experiences determine how I see and approach problems, even scientific ones. And so by extension, diverse teams of people will approach the same problem from multiple perspectives, not just because one is a historian and the other is a computer scientist, but because of who they are. As the problems of this world become ever more challenging, climate change, inequality, global food insecurity, threats to democracy, and the unintended consequences of technological advances, and as human relationships become ever more complex, we absolutely need diverse minds and perspectives addressing these problems. And they must have learned to appreciate each other's differences while discovering their common humanity. So as I walk across our campus, it's pure joy, by the way, if you've never walked across our campus and you need some joy, just, just come on over. <laughs> what I see is our students from every corner of the state and the world, not just enrolled together, but building meaningful relationships together, working together, socializing together, serving the community together, supporting each other, appreciating differences, and practicing common humanity. I am hopeful and inspired by these students. This is UMBC, and this is how we have long been working to make the world a better place. Looking to the future, our challenge is to ensure that inclusive excellence remains our, permeates our institution in every decision, every investment, at every level, consistently. We will get there, and we will take the time to clarify and illuminate what inclusive excellence means to us today and what it will mean in the future. This is critical, particularly when the discourse in some places that will remain unnamed, Hank, in our country has pitted diversity and inclusion against excellence. As disconnected from competitiveness and innovation rather than integral to them. It is especially critical at this moment as higher education awaits legal decisions that are likely to disrupt our proven approaches to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those national contexts stand in stark contrast to the long-standing support of education and the understanding of inclusive excellence that our leaders in local and state government in Maryland have shown. For their support and commitment to all of our students, staff and faculty, I am profoundly grateful. Let's give them a round of applause.
My mother says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So we didn't call any names <laughs> about those other places. Our vision statement also lifts up innovative teaching and learning, which happen both inside and outside of the classroom and are inherently about the promises that we make to our students and the responsibility we feel as a community whose goal first and last is pr to provide all Marylanders, all of our learners, the opportunity to succeed. UMBC has long been a leader in providing this opportunity to our students. And it has been a place that welcomes inquisitive minds from all backgrounds. A place, get this, known to be nerd chic. That's what we do. We say this is a place where it is cool to be smart and safe to be you. We look at our students as if we are looking at our own children. And so I say to all of my students, if you're a student out there, wave, wave your hand. If you're a student, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. This is what we're saying to each of you as our students. By our words and through our actions, we want you to feel that you belong and know that you are welcomed. When you struggle, we want to provide you with the academic, mental health, and well-being resources that you need in the time and manner that you need them. If you are neurodiverse or have a disability, we want the full range of opportunities at UMBC not only to be available, but to be accessible in a way that shows you that we thought about you before you arrived. And if you are first in your family to go to college or pursue a graduate degree, we want to provide you with the guidance to demystify this world and welcome you into it. We want to remove barriers that, are, that would block your success. Those barriers, whether they're financial or otherwise, we want to remove them so that you have a clear path to success. We want you to connect deeply with the community in which you live and work, to seek ways to genuinely and authentically contribute to its well being, to enjoy giving more than receiving, and to cultivate that special joy that is found only in service to others. And we want you to be inspired and challenged by your experience. And I want you to emerge whole with your resilience and confidence strengthened with an assurance that you can change the world. This is the promise that we are making to our students. <clears throat> Looking to the future, our challenge at UMBC and our privilege is to consider the whole student and all the factors that impact success inside and outside of the classroom. We will coordinate academic, financial, mental health, and well being services and communicate seamlessly so that all students may know through our preparation, our spaces, and our programs not only that we considered them, but we were actually expecting them. Now to something else that is, I should say else because they are dear to my heart. Now to something else that's dear to my heart, research. Last year, UMBC ascended to the nation's highest level of research activity, achieving the Carnegie classification as a research one institution. Yes, you should clap. This designation, shared by fewer than 150 other institutions nationally, is an acknowledgement of the years of research growth, strength, and excellence across the disciplines. Our research excellence was again on display earlier in this week during the Community Engaged Scholarship Symposium. If you were not present, you missed it. It was a thing of beauty. My colleagues from across all the disciplines 
displayed the values and principles that we will forever stand on as we pursue our research. The first is that teaching and research go hand in hand. Academic research is always enhanced by engagement of students and teaching at its best is always informed and infused with research. The second principle that I saw on full display is that scholarship in the arts, humanities, and social sciences are at the heart of the research enterprise. Science, my humanists go ahead. Uh -huh. You know that I'm a chemist, okay? But science, technology, and engineering alone will not improve the human condition. We need deep understanding of and collaboration among the arts, humanities, social sciences, and STEM. The third principle is that research and inclusive excellence are not in opposition. Oh, let me say it again. Research and inclusive excellence are not in opposition. Even as I make this statement, consider this. While climate change is a global issue, fewer than 10% of the PhD recipients and faculty in the environmental sciences are people of color. As the challenge of ethics and unintentional consequences of technology loom large, only 20% of undergraduate computer science degrees in the United States go to women. When poverty and wealth disparities are more evident every day, fewer than 12% of PhDs in economics are awarded to underrepresented minorities. So I go back to my statement, research and inclusive excellence are not in opposition, okay? Those statistics should lead us all to question whose ideas are not being heard, whose environments, neighborhoods, and communities are not being considered, what talent are we leaving untapped and underutilized. For decades, UMBC has been a national leader in addressing this great divide for undergraduate students, most famously through the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. And we have made strides with creative programs and initiatives for faculty and graduate student diversity. Looking to the future, our challenge is to ensure that graduate students, faculty, and staff across each and every one of our disciplines represents the communities that we serve locally and globally. This is one of the most intransigent problems in all of academia. I believe that we can set the example for the nation just as we have in the past. We will strategically grow our research enterprise in ways that build upon our interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary strengths and create a convergence of talent and individuals from all walks of life. In doing so, we will become a unique research university and a destination for graduate students, faculty, and staff who are seeking a welcoming, vibrant, creative, diverse research environment. This is the work that we will do together. Finally, I cannot say how grateful I am that this institution has as a core value civic engagement that UMBC has been recognized by the Carnegie Foundation with its community engagement classification is an acknowledgement of the deep, long-standing commitment and bond between campus and community. We believe in the power of shared humanness and the possibility of collective agency. And we take seriously the responsibility of being in community and of being in service to the community. It is why more than 300 UMBC students from our Sherman Reach Together tutoring program 
devoted more than 10,000 hours to tutoring third and fifth graders from Lakeland, Westport, Arundel, and Cherry Hill Elementary Schools to address the decline in math scores during COVID. It is why our CHOICE program serves 800 youth annually and more than 30,000 since its inception in 1989 to promote positive outcomes for youth and families across central Maryland and to reduce the school to prison pipeline. And it is why our Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement works in so many ways to help individuals and groups develop the knowledge, skills, and perspectives needed to continue a thriving democracy. We understand that civic engagement is not about people to be studied or tasks to be completed from a distance. It is about developing cultural and global humility, empathy, and grace and fostering authentic connection and sustained commitment. We are developing lifelong learners who will have a lifelong practice of service and civic engagement. This work for us is not abstract or theoretical. It's concrete and it's tangible. So place matters. Why are we here? literally here, in this community, in this city. Our location, debated as it was in 1966, fully and deeply informs our institutional responsibility as citizens and neighbors and as a public institution. From the seventh floor of the library where I have been spending a lot of time these days, I know those of you who know why, we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> I see in the foreground of our campus, it's beautiful. I wish you, when you come, you will go to the window with me. Freeman took you to the roof, I'm gonna take you to the window. <laughs> I see in the foreground our campus and our students, faculty and staff. Then on the edge, I see Arbutus and Catonsville. And then I have this magnificent view of the Baltimore, of the Baltimore skyline. I think that this picture tells me every time I go to that window about the people with whom our lives are connected in proximity and purpose. Looking to the future, our challenge and our distinct opportunity is to deepen our collaborations with area residents, alumni, industry partners, government officials, and peers in higher education to advance civic engagement and a thriving innovation ecosystem and to create healthier communities in our neighborhood, across Maryland and beyond. Our lives are indeed connected. And I already love and am deeply committed to everything that I can see outside of that window. Our ambition for the future is bold, like UMBC itself. This ambition and our shared vision will require resolve, relationship, and just so my faculty know I have, and staff know I haven't lost my mind, it will require resources. <laughs> People keep saying to me, that's a lot. How are you going to pay for it? <laughs> we will strengthen key relationships with our neighbors, especially as we imagine the future of our Spring Grove campus and with government leaders as we continue our work together in some, on some of the biggest challenges in the state. We will expand our partnerships with area schools and community colleges to enroll and graduate even more Marylanders in the year to come, in the years to come. My, my enrollment people got nervous when I said year because they thought next year I was going to ask them to do that. <laughs> we will enhance collaboration with USM institutions to further leverage our individual strengths. We will expand and create new relationships with those outside of our state who share our aspirations and values. And we will seek increased philanthropy and new streams of revenue to invest in our future and build momentum in achieving our vision. 
those resources will allow us to welcome a diverse community and support them with the resources that they need to succeed. This includes creating and maintaining the infrastructure to fuel a thriving Research One institution and spur it to and spur its impact locally and globally. After nine months as your president, I am even more inspired by what I have seen, heard, and learned, and I'm even more committed to this challenge. The vision is real, not just words on a page, and I know we can achieve it. I know it because I have seen what UMBC has already accomplished, and because I have seen the power of this community. I'll end where I started. My parents would be so proud just because they love their daughter. <laughs> but they would be even prouder that UMBC embodies the values that they instilled in me. What a gift to them and to me. Thank you for the honor and joy of serving as your president, and I am truly grateful to be a member of this beloved community. Thank you so very much.